Hey, can we just talk about my new top for a minute? Like, look how cute. Zara. <laughs> obsessed, a little bit obsessed with it. So today is a video that I sort of have been meaning to film for a while, and I think it's probably time for me to do it. And it is to clarify my stance on this whole complicated world of green, clean, organic, natural products versus products that are low toxin versus conventional products. And when I say products, I'm referring to all kinds of beauty products, but then also all kinds of lifestyle products, cleaning products and things that we use in our day-to-day -day lives and everything. So this is a very complicated topic. I did, <laughs> in true Mercedes fashion, make some notes to kind of guide my talking about this, but I just thought it might be helpful to clarify kind of my current position on this topic and sort of help you understand how I personally navigate deciding what products I want to buy, what brand. with a caveat that I am not a perfect person by any means. We all live in contradiction. It's inevitable in contemporary life that we're going to. We cannot have a set of ethics and morals and adhere to them 100%. It's absolutely impossible. So I hope that I don't inadvertently offend anybody in talking through this video. It's just my own personal opinion on these things and it's an approach that has evolved over a number of years. In general, in life, I have come to a place where I think that moderation is really important. I really disavow perfectionism in all areas of life. And like I was saying, I think it's really impossible to live one's life in a way that is according to this set of standards. I identified some kind of main areas that I think guide people's reasons why they want to pursue shopping for alternative products, food, beauty products, what have you. And a hierarchy that these areas of concern will have in your life it's going to differ from person to person. So for example, you could be really concerned about your own personal health and the toxins that you're exposed to on a daily basis. You could be really concerned about environmental health and the effect that our consumption practices are having on the environment more broadly. You could be really concerned with animal health and well-being. So this is what obviously drives the whole cruelty-free movement and being against animal testing. Some people are very motivated by sustainability, having a focus on sustainable production techniques. Another issue is fair trade and labor issues, which actually I think that this is something that does not get talked about enough. I think we're overly concerned with our own individual health and the health of animals. And we don't really think about the really unjust, unfair labor practices that are taking place in this country, <laughs> even on organic farms and things like that. So to me, I think that that's like a really big social justice component that needs to be part of this conversation more. Another issue is kind of the local economy argument. So for me personally, I really like to support brands and products that are made in the United States. You know, the list goes on and on. A couple other ones I noted were the product quality is something that goes hand in hand with this too. So a lot of these brands that are attuned to all of these issues are made in small batches. So they're very more, they're much more potent. They're fresh. They come in sustainable, healthy packaging, not packaged in plastic. So as you can see, there are so many issues that go into deciding as consumers what we want to put our money towards. For lack of a better way to kind of compartmentalize or categorize this, I have kind of an 80-20 approach to this. I think that there's this kind of myth of perfection that really pervades people's lifestyle habits. And for any of you nerds out there, there's a really great academic book that I had to read for one of my qualifying exams when I was in graduate school. And it's by an environmental sociologist by the name of Andrew Zaz, and it's called Shopping Our Way to Safety. And it's a really eye-opening academic perspective on this myth that our consumption habits can kind of keep us safe. So they can keep us safe from toxins, they can keep us 
from getting cancer, they can keep us in good health. And it's just not the case. Despite your consumption habits, as I'm sure you're probably aware, there are things that happen on meso and macro level scales that we have zero control over. Of course, we can become engaged in our government and we can vote politicians into power that, you know, are more in touch and in tuned with sustainable environmental practices and things related to social justice and creating healthier environments for all people. But it's just not the case that by shopping at Whole Foods and you know, using all organic skincare that you're going to be guaranteed a safe life. It's just not the way, it's just not the world that we live in. There is, you know, the soil quality that our food is grown in has changed dramatically over the last 50 to 100 years. There is air pollution. We're exposed to electromagnetic radiation and, you know, cell phone and internet raise and all this stuff on a daily basis so we can only do the best that we can do and also that being said there's this kind of um what you do inevitably is going to have an effect positive or negative even if it's not intended on someone or something else we're dependent we live in an interdependent world we're dependent on the environment we're dependent on other people we're dependent on animals so I think that we can try and minimize the destructive impacts and make it more reciprocal right, rather than just kind of pillaging, for lack of a better word. Despite the fact that there's a lot of things that we don't have control over, that doesn't mean that we do nothing. I just think it means that we're conscious and aware of these things and we're trying to constantly refine and practice our ethics and moral stances. <clears throat> so it's a practice and it's not a static thing and like I said this is something that I feel constantly evolves but I do feel that we have a responsibility to ourselves and to others and to the planet to think about these things and have conversations about them. A little, I wanted to give you a sort of little basic guide on how I decide what products that I want to buy and again, I am not an expert on reading ingredient labels. I am definitely still learning. I think that it takes a long time to kind of educate oneself about all of the chemicals that we kind of can do have some control over what we subject ourselves to on a daily basis through our personal care products. So in general, some of the things I try and avoid most that I am most familiar with, the biggest offenders are things like parabens, phthalates, sulfates, anything that has artificial fragrance, talc, um, dimethicones, phenoxyethanol, which is a preservative, products that have alcohol in them, Japanese honeysuckle, which is supposed to allegedly mimic the effect of a paraben in the body, and things that are packaged in plastic. Those are just kind of like my ones that if I scan an ingredient list and I see, I will definitely think twice about purchasing that. So I've mentioned the, this before, but a really great introductory read if you want to start learning about chemicals in personal care products is the No More Dirty Looks book. And they go through really thoroughly kind of the biggest offenders and give really great suggestions for things to start transitioning in and out of. Another wonderful resource that you probably are aware of, but you have to kind of learn how to use it the right way, and it's the way that I have learned the most about ingredients, kind of how I'm going to decide whether or not I'm going to buy a product. And it's the Environmental Working Group Database. Now, I personally don't think this website is the most user-friendly that it could be. I kind of think that they need a redesign, and I think it's kind of clunky, and it's just not wonderful. So Beauty Nature's Way is a YouTube channel and she did a really great video about how to actually use the Environmental Working Group database. So I'm going to link that down below. I don't want to reinvent the wheel because I found her video really helpful. In particular, there's this really great function where if a product that you're going to look up the, the rating on isn't already in the system, you can create your own report. Basically, they call create your own report. So you can input the ingredients of a makeup or skincare or beauty product or whatever, and it will give you a rating. 
you have to create an account through the website to do this but once you get the hang of it it's really easy to do and that's how i'm able to find out things like the by terry ombre black stars are only rated a two which is considered low toxin zeros ones and twos are low toxin three to sixes i think are moderate hazard and seven and above is considered highly toxic so what happens and this is why i think it's such a useful tool to learn how to build your own report because there's it's really not super comprehensive like no charlotte tilbury products are in there no like mark jacobs like a lot of new makeup isn't really in there after you build your own report you put in the ingredients and you know whatever you'll see when you go watch that video how you do this it will tell you each ingredient and if it's linked to a hazard or not and what that hazard is if it's an endocrine disruptor if it's a, a carcinogen you know what have you that's how i have learned about particular ingredients and what to avoid for example phenoxyethanol is often used as a preservative but a better one to look for is potassium sorbate but you learn this by inputting your ingredients and reading the output from the environmental working group so if once it sees all the ingredients in it will assign a number to the product and at that point then it's up to you whether or not you want to use it or not for me this is where it kind of gets complicated there are certain things i'm going to be 100 percent honest with you where i don't even and this is the minority there are certain products that I just want and I don't really care how toxic they are I don't even really want to know I know that that's kind of whatever for example certain NARS lipsticks certain perfumes that I have I really think I'm going to buy the Orbe dry texturizing spray things like this it's not a lot and they are things that I don't use on a daily basis but sometimes I just get in my head that I want something and I'm going to get it and I'm going to use it sparingly and I'm not going to have a purist approach. That being said, there will be products that I kind of think I would like, but once I see the ingredients, I'm like, no, it's not really worth it. So this is a very personal practice and it just sort of depends on what you feel you're going to derive the most pleasure and utility from. And in general, I guess I would say that the high priorities for products to get that are as clean as possible are things that are actually going to be absorbed into your skin. So any kind of skincare, any kind of face makeup, any kind of shampoo that's going to be going into your scalp, any kind of body care products, body oils and lotions. To me, those are like the first thing to tackle and deodorant. Other than that, like mascara, lipsticks that you're going to wear a couple times a month, even eyeshadow, they're they're just not, they cover such a small surface area and they're, you're using them in such small amounts and so infrequently that your body is able to process those chemicals. And then there's this kind of whole other issue for people that are driven mostly by the cruelty-free label on makeup. And this is something that I find really interesting because things some, like ColourPop and Gerard Cosmetics and Too Faced there's a lot of chemicals in those products so it's the chemical concern is very secondary to their concern for the label of cruelty free and no animal testing and no animal products or derivatives in the products in the makeup itself i kind of like don't fully understand that i think that you need both so if you're going to have a cruelty free product i think it should be safe for you as well. So I am going to choose, you know, a product with clean ingredients over a cruelty-free product if I had to choose. Now, I freaking love animals. Like, don't, I don't mean to say that I don't, but I just don't understand a cruelty-free product that also has chemicals in it and supporting that. Yeah, this is such a personal thing and it's, you know, up to you to sift through the information and decide what works for you at this point in your yeah. life. I would highly recommend giving this book a read and just arming yourself with information so that you can be in a vantage point to actually say, okay, I'm going to use this even though I know what's in here or 
I'm not going to use that because I'm really not okay with that. No perfectionism, just a self-reflexive practice about our consumption habits and the effect that it has on our bodies, the environment, and other people and animals. So I hope this was helpful. When I sit down and do these kind of chatty videos about a topic, I often feel that I'm just really, really rambling. You know, I don't know how coherent it seems to you, but I hope you got something out of this. Definitely, you know, ask me questions or leave me comments about any approaches that you have developed for sifting through this whole complex world of issues and ethics and morals. I will see you guys in another beauty video super soon, I'm sure. And take care, have a great week. I'll talk to you later, bye.